Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you all. It's a tremendous privilege to be here. Alan's mention of his unwashed hand after shaking with Reagan, I didn't try and not wash mine, but my greatest hero growing up was meeting Sir Winston Churchill, whom I met as a boy. And among the many famous stories of Churchill, one of my favorites comes to mind when I'm here this evening. It's the story of a time, as far as I know, the only time he spoke at a North American commencement. He was in Canada. And they knew the great man loved whiskey. Sorry to come back to the alcohol again. <laughs> they knew the great man loved whiskey, and it was actually before noon. He didn't drink whiskey before noon, but they offered him some. And since he loved it, he took it. And since he took it, everyone on the platform party said yes to, and they went all the way down the end until they got to a gentleman who was evidently the local bishop, Methodist bishop. He drew himself up to his full height, and he was evidently very small. And he said in a loud voice, I would rather commit adultery than drink whiskey. <laughs> Churchill heard this and said, come back, I didn't know we had a choice today. <laughs> Sadly, that reminds me of many well-intentioned Christian voices in the public square, which is the direct contrast of all that John Jay is standing for, so that people who are followers of Jesus speak out with tremendous thoughtfulness and responsibility and timeliness into our world today. So it's a, an enormous privilege, Alan, to be invited to, to speak tonight. When my book came out last summer, I came back from our home in Oxford, and I was invited up to Capitol Hill by a veteran who'd been there 30 years. He said, I've read your book. I like it, but I've got one disagreement. It's too optimistic. He said, America doesn't have five years until the decline is irreversible. And as we talked for the next hour and a half or so, he kept returning to the fact that the deepest issue today was lack of genuine national leadership to address the real State of the Union. He's true that I deliberately ended my book with hope, partly because I think all Christian books should end with hope, but partly because I do think that America's at a stage where it still could be turned around with leadership and deep understanding. But of course, there are other options too. And when Douglas invited me, he asked me to address more seriously the future of freedom, including the idea that it may not be renewed as it might be. So let me go beyond the book when I finish tonight. For me, one of the key themes in writing about America was St. Augustine's reminder that to understand a nation, you look for its loved things held in common, or what it loves supremely. Put in modern terms, you don't look at the size of its population or the throw weight of its missiles, the prestige of its universities. No. What is it it loves supremely held in common. And there's no question by Americans or by outsiders that America's great supreme love is freedom. And if Augustine was right, then he says you can judge the nobility of a nation by what it loves, and you can judge the health of a nation by what it loves. And it was that thought that set me thinking, what was the health today of American freedom? You may know the story of a young Massachusetts scholar in 1843 who was determined to interview all the remaining veterans of the Revolutionary Wars. And among many he interviewed, he met Captain Levi Preston, who was 70 years older than him, 91. The old gentleman was very stooped, a veteran of both Lexington and Concord. And the young student said to him, now, why did you go out to fight? 
And rather surprised at such an obvious question, the old boy said nothing and slowly straightened himself up. Well, surely you were oppressed. We weren't oppressed, he growled. Well, what about the Stamp Act? Never paid a penny for it, he said. What about the tea tax? Never drank a drop of it, he said. The boys threw it in the harbor before we got there. Well, what about the great books on freedom, Sydney and Harrington and Locke? Never heard of them, he said. The only books we had were the Bible, Isaac Watts' his hymnal, and a farmer's almanac. And the interview went on like this, and the student was rather puzzled. And so he said again, now why did you go out to fight? And this time, the old gentleman gave an immortal reply. We had always been free, and we intended to be free always. And the redcoats didn't mean that we should. Think of that. Always free. Free always. He wasn't the only one who put it like that. Nathaniel Green, the general, and many, many others did. I think as an admirer of this country, although an outsider, that the most daring thing at the very heart of the great American experiment is the idea that they could create a free republic which could remain free, maybe forever. Now, of course, they knew there were tremendous challenges. One was that freedom never lasted. So one challenge is lasting freedom. But the other challenge was the size of this country. Democratic country like Athens wasn't even a country, a city-state. And if you look back in history, you can see the democracies had always been very small. Aristocracies had been medium-sized. But actually, empires and large monarchies had been the largest of all. And yet this was to be a large country that was a free republic. How did they do it? Let me set out some of the steps to thinking of that, bringing us from their challenges right down to where we are today. Clearly, they understood the three foundational tasks of establishing a free country and a free society. What's interesting about these three is the first is obvious and much celebrated. The second is less obvious but still celebrated. And the third is the one often forgotten, and yet the one that's absolutely urgent today. First task, winning freedom. 1776, the revolution. But of course, the French did it, 1789. The Russians did it, 1917. The Chinese did it. I was there at the climax, 1949. That's not terribly original. The second task is harder, though, ordering freedom, providing a political and moral framework for freedom. And the Russians and the French and the Chinese did not do it. In fact, they spiraled down to a demonic disorder that was worse than the tyrannies they replaced. The genius of this country, freedom was not only won, freedom was ordered, the Constitution. But the third task is the hard one. Winning freedom, ordering freedom, sustaining freedom, or as they often put it, perpetuating our institutions. Many Americans do quote Benjamin Franklin, meeting Mrs. Powell outside the Philadelphia Convention and asked what they'd achieved. He answered famously, a republic, madam, and you remember the next words, if you can keep it. And you can see that notion running through many of the founders, and you can see it for example, the young Abraham Lincoln, when he was only 28 and asked to address the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield and asked what was his topic for the day, he chose the topic, the perpetuation of our institutions. How many 28-year-olds would choose that as a topic today? And he looks at what he calls the accounts running, 50 years on from the revolution, where are the pluses, where are the minuses, looking like a political accountant to see how we're doing in perpetuating our institutions. I've never heard any American leader address that 
in the 30 years that I've lived in Washington. In fact, the only book that I've known address it well is John Gardner's book on, on renewal. But today, when it's most urgent of all, perpetuating, sustaining freedom, hardly anyone discusses it. It is self-evident that we're strong, we're free, we're powerful, and it will remain this way forever. The second thing to explore with the framers is their deeply realistic understanding of the menaces to sustaining freedom. They were, of course, revolutionary, but they were also rooted. They knew their history. In fact, we could say they used history to defy history. So they knew well from Cicero and Polybius and many of the classical authors what were the challenges of sustaining freedom. And you can see that there are three. And what's interesting is that the first one they ignored, although we know we can't today. But the second and third, which they took deeply seriously, are almost completely ignored by modern Americans. The first menace to freedom is external. A nation suddenly finds itself with a larger or better armed nation against it. And all they can do is be vigilant. For obvious reasons, that wasn't their prime concern. They came from a small protected island, most of them. And they they were living on a large protected continent with the world's two greatest oceans as its buffer. And so the nearest serious enemy is 3,000 miles away. And you can see this didn't concern them. Even the speech I mentioned of Abraham Lincoln, he almost poo-poos the idea of what he calls a transatlantic Bonaparte putting his feet down in the cornfields of Ohio. Unthinkable. Of course, in the age of intercontinental ballistic missiles and box cutters, we know after 9-11 we take that very seriously. But the second and third menaces, which they took deeply seriously, we almost don't. The second is what Polybius, the Greek historian, calls the corruption of customs. As Polybius discusses the six forms of government, three positive and three corrupt versions, he says what's decisive for any country is its constitution. And maybe for that reason, many Americans with the oldest surviving constitution, etc., etc., fall asleep. But Polybius goes on. He says what's decisive is a nation's constitution. But if you have a corruption of customs the moral values, the standards, the traditions, the best constitution in the world may be subverted so that you have the same name but a different reality. And the times of greatest danger that that may happen are the times of power and prosperity. The third menace, in one word, time. We'd say as Christians, the presence of sin and the passing of time. As Lincoln says later in one of his other famous speeches, the truth that is true, the sages find out and tell the monarch in all times and all places, this too shall pass. Time. Cicero says what's revolutionary becomes routine. What's fresh becomes faded. Many of you probably know that the year that the Constitution happened was the year that Edward Gibbon published the last volume of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And in his last chapter, he raises the question, why did Rome fall? This fall beyond belief. And his first answer, the injuries of time. And we know now that he got the idea for writing the book Because when he was in Rome, he saw grass growing and cattle grazing where the emperors and the senators had once deliberated, the injuries of time. In that same speech, the 28-year-old Lincoln talks about the silent artillery of time doing its assault on the walls and the ramparts of the Republic, which no enemy could do. You hardly ever have that sense today of that. And yet that was once a living reality that time was passing and freedom never lasts forever. 
Which leads to a third point, which we can in interject with our modern understanding, which is to come to terms with the great paradox of freedom. The greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. If we look why freedom undermines itself, often becoming permissiveness and then license, or freedom-loving safety for freedom and being so obsessed with security that security undermines freedom, or freedom being so prized that those who fight for freedom will do anything for freedom, including ways that contradict freedom itself and undermine freedom. Now, you can look at that paradox of freedom down many thinkers in the centuries at a number of levels. The first historical, free societies are, in the eyes of history, few and fleeting. As one historian puts it, if you take the clock of many centuries, free societies, oh, sorry, many centuries and compress them into one hour, free societies would only come in in the last five minutes. But you can make the same point more deeply politically. As the great French philosopher Montesquieu put it, freedom requires not just structures of freedom, but the spirit of freedom in the citizens. The structures of freedom, like the Constitution, the law, can be laid down once for all. But the spirit of liberty has to pass from generation to generation and if that spirit of liberty dies, the structures alone will not preserve it. What Tocqueville later calls the habits of the heart. But the deepest part of the paradox of freedom is the simple conundrum that all freedom requires restraint. And yet the only restraint appropriate to freedom is self-restraint. Yet self-restraint is precisely what freedom tends to undermine when it flourishes and you have the drift towards permissiveness and license all over again. But that leads to the famous antidote to these things. And to me, it's probably the most brilliant and daring attempt to see that freedom could be sustained that I found in all history. And yet, outside the world of scholarship and so on, many Americans don't either bother with it or even know what it is. Tocqueville calls their solution, and they didn't give it a name themselves, Tocqueville calls it the habits of the heart. And he insists that American freedom isn't just the product of American laws, but of the habits of the heart, that spirit of liberty sustained from generation to generation, obviously coming from the three nurturing institutions, the family, the faith community, and the schools. My own term for it is the golden triangle of freedom. Because as you read the framers, their speeches and their writings, there are certain themes that are repeated again and again and again, and they virtually form the three legs of a triangle. And rather like the recycling triangle, one that goes round and round and round and round ad infinitum. The first leg, freedom requires virtue. The second leg, virtue requires faith of some sort. And the third leg, faith of any sort, requires freedom, which requires virtue, which requires faith, which requires, and so on. Now you can see in many ways how they expand on this. Take that first leg. Freedom requires virtue, which is what John Adams said. Now virtue for them, obviously, was a word grounded in courage, but included all sorts of things, honesty, loyalty, patriotism, and supremely the importance of character in citizens and in leaders. Now you can see how far we've come from that when you compare, say, their teaching on character with our modern understanding of character. They loved, as you know, words like inalienable and indefeasible and all these sort of words. But there's a sentence in John Adams where he strings all of them together and he's not describing freedom, freedom, 
or rights. He's describing the people's right to know the character of their leaders. In other words, character was on the one hand the bridge between followers and leaders so that followers could trust a leader even in the dark, not knowing the whys and wherefores of the decisions he or she was making. But at the same time, character was the inner bearing of the leader, so that the moments of extraordinary power when he or she could do all sorts of things, character gave them self-restraint. Now compare that, say, with the Clinton impeachment. There was a famous letter to the New York Times by a number of American scholars who said, bluntly, character didn't matter. What mattered today is competence. A president's competence, not the character. But of course, the presidency itself is a simple area where you can see again and again how character counts in enormous ways. President Nixon, for example, actually had the word CQ, not just IQ. But if ever his own administration proved the importance of a character quotient, it was his, with his own insecurity and paranoia, with Henry Kissinger's immense ego and vanity, with Alexander Haig's extraordinary arrogance and power-mongering and so on. And you can see that was an administration that brought itself down almost through its own lack of character. Freedom requires virtue. The second leg, of course, is equally politically incorrect today. Virtue requires faith of some sort. There is, of course, no established religion in this country. And the framers, of course, granted freedom of conscience to atheists. Of course. But they're extremely cherry about a republic of atheists. And if you think, where is the main inspiration to virtue? Where is the main teaching of the content of what virtue is? And where do you find talk of sanctions for those who are not virtuous? Well, in the realm of faith, certainly not in the realm of secularism. But the third leg of the triangle, of course, is the most radical of all. After 1,500 years since the Emperor Theodosius, various forms of established religion in one kind or another, the First Amendment breaks with that and makes faith voluntary and a matter of the dictates of conscience and disestablishes the state churches. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith of some sort, and virtue, uh, faith of any sort, requires freedom. Now, clearly, we're a long, long way from that today. You can see in the 19th century how, first of all, religion began to be more and more privatized as our industrial world arose. And a privatized faith, later described as privately engaging, publicly relevant, is unable to do the job the framers saw that religion at large needed to do. But in the 20th century, we have all sorts of ideas. For example, John Rawls's proceduralism, with the idea that faith and character and virtue are private and should remain inviolably private. And the public square is a neutral arena of competing self-interests where faith and character and virtue are irrelevant. Of course, later on, we have something even more radical in postmodernism. There is no truth. What we call truth is really the will to power. So underlying everything is that power agenda. So even the founding fathers are deconstructed in terms of their power interests and many of their High-flown ideas of freedom, such as the Declaration, thrown out in the light of the way they behave towards slaves and women and so on. So as you look around America today, there is no discussion of sustainable freedom, which is ironic because sustainability is now a fashionable vogue word. Sustainable development, sustainable environment, sustainable capitalism. Everything has to be sustainable, scalable, and so on and so on. But the most important thing to the republic of all, sustainable freedom, never discussed. 
What do we see? Well, many parts of the country, and Dr. Kurth has written on this in some of his essays, you have a severe alienation of leaders, either through neglect or through open dismissal. Significant number of the educated elites who no longer believe in these things at all. But on top of that, we have a deep breakdown in the transmission of American values. The American Republic is in the business of transmitting its values in two ways all the time. One is obviously from the older generation to the younger generation through education. And it's no secret that much of public education is incredibly mediocre and that civic education has almost disappeared since the 1960s. But the other needed transmission is from the old-timers in the country, because there are very few real natives, to the newcomers, immigration. And I'm always rather puzzled in Washington, having heard the immigration debate for nearly 25 years, all sorts of factors are mentioned. Control of borders, English as a language, all sorts of things. I haven't heard one political leader mention the importance of civic education. Now, of course, your wonderful American motto is not only your motto, it's probably your greatest achievement, a pluribus unum, out of many, one. But unless there's a clarity of what the unum is, then there's nothing to balance the pluribus, and all you have is diversity without unity. And on top of that, we have, picking up Polybius' word, a genuine corruption of customs. In many ways, all the issues of the culture wars are things which, for many Americans, would have been self-evident before the 1960s. What's life? What's a family? Is there such thing as truth? Does character matter in a leader? You could go on down the line. All of these are now contested somewhere in this country, and you can see how there's been a profound corruption of many of the deep convictions underlying America. I think that's true of freedom. Because if you put it in philosophical terms, the founder's understanding of freedom was actually much closer to the Jewish and Christian understanding of freedom, where you stress both negative freedom and positive freedom together not one or the other. Negative freedom is freedom from. And of course, freedom starts there. We're never free if we're in chains or under oppression or suffering from addiction or whatever is binding us. Freedom from is preliminary and necessary. But that should lead to freedom for, freedom to be, which requires the truth of knowing who we are and what we're supposed to be. As Lord Acton put it, freedom's not the permission to do what you like. It's the power to do what you ought. Or as our Lord says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But in the current corruption of freedom, you can see that almost all American freedom today, conservative as well as liberal, is freedom from, without any positive content of what freedom means. And so, put simply, current forms of American freedom, conservative and liberal, are unsustainable. And if this goes on, it will spell the decline of this country. Now, in the book, I did turn to things that I think could be done and addressed as remedies. But say that doesn't happen. I just want to mention at this stage some things that we, who are followers of Jesus and people of faith, need to watch out for as freedom becomes more corrupted and more confused. First, let's be very careful about the talk of bare freedom for the reason I said. A lot of talk today of Ayn Rand and the libertarianism and so on. And you can see, while 
Liberals want the government away from their bodies. Conservatives want the governments off their backs. Everyone's freedom is a right to be let alone in that negative sense. And we've got to understand as Christians, that is not freedom that's lasting. Freedom requires truth. Freedom is not the permission to do what we like. It is the power to do what we ought, and we ought to both demonstrate and articulate out into the wider discussion a healthier, although a much more demanding, view of freedom than most of our contemporaries have today. Secondly, I would say, we need to be clear about the difference between liberal and democracy. You can see, particularly in the 20th century, climaxing, say, in the second George Bush administration. Freedom and democracy, freedom and democracy, as if they went hand in hand together. Now, if you know anything about the history of democracy, going all the way back to Plato, the prediction's always been, and the comment has always been, that democracy corrupted is what leads to tyranny. Many monarchs gave much more liberty, although they were kings, and many democracies, when corrupted, became awful tyrannies. Hitler was elected by 51.4% of the people. And you can see how democracy corrupted becomes something very different. Or put it differently. Many Americans read, say, Polybius, monarchies, aristocracies, democracy, corrupt monarchy, tyranny, corrupt aristocracy, oligarchy, corrupt democracy, mob rule. And it's as if we pick our pick from a selection and we've chosen to be Democrats, and Democrats are free people. But if we read Polybius carefully, he talks about the turn of the wheel of history. And none of these stays the same. And each turns into something else. And the tendency is for democracy to turn into mob rule and eventually into tyranny. You can look at a country like Rome and see that it took hundreds of years to go from monarchy to the republic to dictatorship. You can look at the French Revolution and see that within 15 years, they went through all those things in a very short and compressed time. So there's no saying how fast these things happen. But nothing ever stays the same. And we need to learn the difference between liberal, which has become a dirty word today, but really are those whose political philosophy is concerned with personal freedom. And we need to resuscitate that word liberal and break it from many of the ideas of progressivism and statism and socialism and things like this, which are all things that are undermining real freedom. And the third area I think we need to look out for very carefully is beware of those now bestowing equality on us. We need to do much tougher thinking here. Liberty and equality are both ideals, but they're highly competitive. Liberty left to itself produces extreme inequality. But equality, stressed at the expense of liberty, is always artificial, is always coercive, and always guarantees the growth of the umpire, which in our context is, of course, the state. And we need to look at a lot of the talk today of liberty and non-discrimination, and sorry, of equality and non-discrimination and challenge it in the name of far deeper understandings of freedom. But let me finish with what Douglas asked me to do, and I've avoided so far, a European assessment of exceptionalism. Every country is distinctive, but forgive me as a foreigner, I'm extremely wary of American talk of exceptionalism. 
And yet in certain circles, and certainly we heard in the election, many conservatives, that claim to exceptionalism was a litmus test of people being on the right side of things. First, think, I would challenge you to think, I may be wrong, Dr. Kurth can correct me on this. <laughs> First, what actually is exceptional about this country? There have been three main candidates put forward in terms of exceptionalism. First, America's destiny. It became manifest destiny originally, a Puritan destiny. Secondly, the idea that there can be no socialism here. As Ronald Reagan said, there is no left or right in America, simply up or down. And many people back in the 20s said that communism and socialism founded on the reef of roast, pie, uh, roast beef and uh, apple pie. And the third area claim for this exceptionalism is the whole notion of American religiosity. That the world was getting more modern and less religious, but somehow America was the most modern and still the most religious. Now, all those are being claimed as grounds of exceptionalism. What would I say as a European about them? And again, forgive me if I'm ruffling your feathers on this one. First, as historians point out, of more than a hundred great powers in history, what would be really exceptional is a great power that did not claim to be exceptional. In other words, almost everyone has in their time, often inflating distinctives, and every country is different in some ways, up to being great exceptional qualities. The second challenge to exceptionalism comes from what is really the foundation of it? For example, destiny. The New England Puritans got that wrong. The real Puritan idea was that God called every nation in a distinctive way, not just this nation. And when that became manifest destiny, it became, and here's the third problem with exceptionalism, a dangerous delusion that was behind things like the treatment and the abuse of the Cherokees, or behind, say, the war with the Philippines, and so on, things that are dangerous and delusive. But above all, the weakness of claims to exceptionalism is the false idea that it gives America immunity. And that ties in what I've been saying this evening. Gibbon looked at Rome. But the next time you go down to Washington, D.C., my favorite of all the memorials is the Lincoln Memorial. But why do you think that in a thousand years' time that is any more likely not to be where the Roman ruins are today? The presence of sin the passing of time, this too shall pass, especially when the framer's brilliant attempt at a solution to sustainable freedom is so completely ignored. Finish with this thought. You all love, as Americans, Alexis de Tocqueville. You know his book, Democracy in America, but of course he wrote it in French for Frenchmen, not for Americans. And all his life, he was a great admirer of this country, although he had some very severe warnings as to how democracy might go, and they're remarkably prescient in terms of where we are today. But largely, he praised the American democracy and criticized the French Revolution. But towards the end of his life, he made this little interesting remark. He said this, with a revolution, as with a novel, the hard part to invent is the ending. In other words, I would put it, your framers, with all their blind spots like the treatment of slaves and the treatment of women, your framers wrote a brilliant first chapter to this republic. 
and many generations have added distinctive chapters since then. But I think today, the chapter that the next generation writes is going to be the one that's the most critical of all. Can freedom last forever? What was the framers' answer? What is the present generation's answer? The present generation's answer is simply unsustainable and will lead inevitably to decline. But there is the possibility of renewal. Thank you. Well, Dr. Geddes began his presentation by remarking about a conversation he had not long after he had published his book, and the person that he was talking to said that uh, he agreed with everything in the book except he was more pessimistic than Dr. Geddes. Well, actually, I suppose that I would like to meet this person because that's precisely my own view. I agree with virtually everything in Oz Guinness's book, but my own view will be even more pessimistic. I will, however, uh, try to conclude, as Dr. Guinness suggested, as we Christians must conclude, on a, uh, a vision of hope. But it will be a somewhat different vision uh, than that of Dr. Guinness. That perhaps will be the only difference between uh, his view and my own. Uh, let me begin my more pessimistic view by quoting once again, or referring once again, to that one of that favored author of Americans who was not an American, Tocqueville. And Tocqueville, when he wrote about democracy in America, certainly wrote about the habits of the heart, uh, the ideals uh, of democracy, uh, and certainly the primacy of freedom. But it was so often the case in 19th century writers or for that matter, even late 18th century writers, they not only looked at the ideals of what they were writing about, but the interest. They often grounded their analyses and their proposals in the social basis of what they were writing about. So Tocqueville has many chapters on the social and economic basis of American democracy and Americans' love for freedom. One of those bases was the fact that actually in their daily lives, Americans were for the most part free, or more precisely, independent. It wasn't just a declaration of independence of the United States. That was made by a population that compared to any other population on the planet at that time was composed of independent people, independent small farmers, independent proprietors, independent professionals, as the phrase liberal profession once meant. America was a country of many, many people who in their daily lives, even their economic lives, were independent of others. Well, they might be, as Thomas Jefferson was, in some kind of debt dependency, but they were not necessarily dependent on some particular boss or employer. Uh, of course, uh, the great exception was slavery, and everybody understood that was a slavery. And in that America, therefore, you had, day after day, the habits of work reinforce the habits of the heart. A great change has occurred in that America uh, of the 19th century down to the present. The change occurred principally in the move from the 19th to the 20th century the move from a nation of independent uh, farmers, independent proprietors, free professionals living in small towns uh, into giant um, uh, corporations, organizations uh, of employees. And in our own recent decades, even the free professions, such as lawyers and doctors, have found themselves swept into big corporate firms same with academia. And so it is that, for, that America has become, as it moved from the 19th century to the 20th century, a country not of independent people in their daily work lives, but of dependent people, not of entrepreneurs uh, in the broadest sense, get up and go, uh, but of employees. <clears throat> 
And that's made for a whole different, I think, psychology and perhaps a whole different kind of habits of the heart and a whole different conception of freedom. It is not an accident that in America today that in the workday, people really are not free, but they do crave freedom. And in a way, the society gives it to them, not in their workday, but in their leisure nights, in their entertainment. Uh, it is not an accident that as the diminishment of freedom has occurred in one's work life, there has been the expansion and the corruption of freedom from uh, liberty to license, as uh, Guinness has said, uh, in leisure and entertainment and the rest. And so therefore, when we ask today, who are the Americans who are actually living freedom, like that soldier that was interviewed so many years after the revolution, uh, and who will therefore uh, embodiment and, and stand up for it, it turns out there are very few such Americans today. And so the broad base of Americans have become dependent rather than independent. That hollows out the basis for freedom. And of course, under the current uh, uh, political tendencies, especially that in the Democratic Party and the progressive movement within that, that has been a tendency for 100 years, culminating and being fulfilled before our very eyes, in that uh, Americans become even more dependent upon the government. I read recently an article about young people in this current uh, economic crisis. More and more young people having more and more difficulty getting their foot on the rung of uh, economic success are uh, hoping more and more that government will be their solu the solution to the problem. This historically has been the case when you've had a long economic crisis, long period of unemployment, and especially for younger people. They can no longer have confidence in the answer of the old established parties, and so they begin to look for more extreme versions of parties, or at least for more intrusive actions in government that will help uh, support them. And so it is that we have very few people in this country, I've been speaking of the a large uh, a level of the population at large, uh, but if we were also look at the elites, the elites themselves have very little interest or conception in the old ideas of freedom. Of course, they want freedom uh, to do what they want to do as heads of corporations or of other large institutions, but they uh, do not particularly care about freedom as it was understood by the Founding Fathers, understood by Tocqueville, understood by the other great uh, leaders that um, Os Guinness has written about who uh, engaged in the long history of sustaining our freedom. So both at the level, a level of the wider population and the level of the elites, we have to ask who are the people who will actually bring about a renewal of freedom in this country? And we can come up with very few. Now this raises a very important problem for Christians. It may turn out that uh, with the um, uh, American society becoming more and more a society of isolated, independent individuals ruled by a centralizing, uh, directing government, that we will essentially have a society that is more and more alien to Christians, and Christians will find themselves in this, Americans, in this America, but not of it. And so instead of being able to reform the American social and political order, they may have to endure it. Or more positively, begin to once again create a Christian community in basically what is a secular and more and more a pagan society. And in that sense, uh, it would remind us of the conception of Saint, another conception of St. Augustine of course, who quite properly was quoted by Professor Guinness as uh, focusing on what a nation loves and what it holds in common. Of course, he also focused on the sharp distinction between the city of man and the city of God. He also focused on the errors of the so-called Pelagian heresy, the thought that people thought somehow they just might reform the old Rome by bringing back the Roman virtues. He understood that it was too late for that. And so there would have to be 
the creation, the construction of a whole new Christian order in the decaying uh, husk of the old Roman Empire. And is it possible that Americans today might have to begin to think in such a way? It sounds so un-American. But that's because, as Professor Guinness has pointed out, in some ways America is not just exceptionally and uniquely American. It's like other countries too. I was recently reading a wonderful new book by Rodney Stark called The Triumph of Christianity. He analyzed the, dec the decrepitude, the oppressiveness, the poverty, the misery of life in uh, pagan and authoritarian Rome and how the Christian churches brought mercy into that misery. They brought hope into that despair by coming together, caring for each other, and even caring for those who were without. And so they created a whole new order based upon biblical teachings, based upon Christ's teachings, uh, and based upon communion and community amongst themselves. That was a standing rebuke and a living alternative, dare I say, a city on a hill, to the pagan society all around them. So is it possible that the, the true Christian calling in the generations to come, perhaps as early as this generation, will not be so much as to reform the American political order that may have already reached a point, not unlike what St. Augustine observed the Roman order, but rather to reconstruct, revive a Christian order uh, within America. Uh, so Christians have been for quite some time in America, but not of it. And the time must, may come where the contrast between America, what it means to be American and what it means to be Christian may become more and more pronounced and more and more cross that we'll have to pick up to bear.